please subscribe my channel. 1984 Part 1 Thought Crime Chapter 1 Big Brother is Watching You It was a bright, cold day in April and the clocks were striking 13. Winston Smith hurried home to Victory Mansions with his head down to escape the terrible wind. A cloud of dust blew inside with him, and the hall smelled of dust and yesterday's food. At the end of the hall, a poster covered one wall. It showed an enormous face, more than a meter wide. The face of a handsome man of about 45, with a large, black moustache. The man's eye seemed to follow Winston as he moved. Below the face were the words Big Brother is watching you. Winston went up the stairs. He did not even try the lift. It rarely worked and at the moment the electricity was switched off during the day to save money for hate week. The flat was on the seventh floor and Winston, who was 39 and had a bad knee, went slowly, resting several times on the way. Winston was a small man and looked even smaller in the blue overalls of the party. His hair was fair and the skin on his face, which used to be pink, was red and rough from cheap soap old razor blades and the cold of the winter that had just ended. Inside his flat, a voice was reading out a list of figures for last year's production of iron. The voice came from a metal square, a telescreen, in the right-hand wall. Winston turned it down, but there was no way of turning it off completely. He moved to the window. Outside, the world looked cold. The wind blew dust and bits of paper around in the street and there seemed to be no color in anything, except in the posters that were everywhere. The face with the black mustache looked down from every corner. There was one on the house opposite. Big Brother is watching you, it said and the eyes looked into Winston's, behind him the voice from the telescreen was still talking about iron. There was now even more iron in Oceania than the ninth three-year plan had demanded. The telescreen had a microphone, so the thought police could listen to Winston at any time of the day or night. They could also watch him through the telescreen. Nobody knew how often they actually did that, but everybody behaved correctly all the time because the thought police might be watching and listening. Winston kept his back to the telescreen. It was safer that way, they couldn't see your face. He looked out over London, the biggest city in this part of Oceania. The 19th century houses were all falling down. There were holes in the streets where the bombs had fallen. Had it always been like this? He tried to think back to the time when he was a boy, but he could remember nothing. He stared at the Ministry of Truth, where he worked. It was an enormous white building, 300 meters high. You could see the white roof, high above the houses, even a kilometer away. From Winston's flat it was just possible to see the three slogans of the party written in enormous letters on the side of the building. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. The Ministry of Truth was called Minitru in Newspeak, the new language of Oceania. Minitru, it was said, had more than 3,000 rooms above the ground and a similar number below. 
the people there worked mainly on news and entertainment. High above the surrounding buildings, Winston could also see the Ministry of Peace, where they worked on war. It was called Minipax in Newspeak. And the Ministry of Plenty Miniplenty which was responsible for the economy. And he could see the Ministry of Love Minilove which was responsible for law and order. The Ministry of Love was the really frightening one. There were no windows in it. Nobody could get anywhere near it unless they had business there. There were guards with guns in black uniforms even in the streets half a kilometre away. Winston turned round quickly. He smiled. It was a good idea to look happy when you were facing the telescreen. He went to his small kitchen. He had not had lunch in the canteen before he left work, but there was no food there except a piece of dark, hard bread for tomorrow's breakfast. He poured himself a cup of colorless, oily gin and drank it down like medicine. It burned him inside, but he felt more cheerful afterwards. He went back to the living room and sat down at a small table to the left of the telescreen. It was the only place in the room where the telescreen could not see him. From a drawer in the table he took out a pen and a big diary with beautiful cream paper which he had bought in an old-fashioned shop in a poor part of the town. Party members like Winston were not allowed to go into ordinary shops, but many of them did. It was the only way to get things like razor blades, Winston opened a diary. This was not illegal. Nothing was illegal, as there were no laws now. But if the diary was found they would punish him with death or with twenty-five years in a prison camp. He took the pen in his hand, then stopped. He felt sick. It was a decisive act to start writing. Earlier that morning, a terrible noise from the big telescreen at the Ministry of Truth had called all the workers to the center of the hall for the two minutes' hate. The face of Emmanuel Goldstein, enemy of the people, filled the telescreen. It was a thin, clever face, with its white hair and small beard, but there was something unpleasant about it. Goldstein began to speak in his sheep-like voice, criticizing the party, making nasty attacks on Big Brother, demanding peace with Eurasia. In the past, nobody knew exactly when, Goldstein had been almost as important in the party as Big Brother himself, but then he had worked against the party. Before he could be punished with death, he had escaped. Nobody knew how, exactly. Somewhere he was still alive, and all crimes against the party came from his teaching. Behind Goldstein's face on the telescreen were thousands of Eurasian soldiers. Oceania was always at war with either Eurasia or East Asia. That changed, but the hate for Goldstein never did. The thought police found his spies every day. They were called the Brotherhood, people said, although Winston sometimes asked himself if the Brotherhood really existed. Goldstein had also written a book, a terrible book, a book against the party. It had no title. It was just known as the book. As Goldstein's face filled the telescreen and Eurasian soldiers marched behind him. The hate grew. People jumped up and down, shouting and screaming so they could not hear Goldstein's voice. 
Winston was shouting too, it was impossible not to. A girl behind him, with thick, dark hair was screaming, Pig! Pig! at Goldstein, and suddenly she picked up a heavy Newspeak dictionary and threw it at the telescreen. It hit Goldstein on the nose and fell to the floor. Winston had often seen this girl at the ministry, but he had never spoken to her. He did not know her name, but he knew she worked in the fiction department. He had seen her with tools so he guessed she was a mechanic on the story writing machines. She was a confident looking girl of about 27, and she walked quickly. She wore the narrow red belt of the young people's league tied tightly round her overalls. Winston had disliked her from the first moment he saw her. He disliked nearly all women especially young and pretty ones. The young women were always most loyal to the party and were happiest to spy on others. But this girl was especially dangerous, he thought. Once, when he had seen her in the canteen, she had looked at him in a way that filled him with black terror. He even thought she might be working for the Thought Police. As the screaming at Goldstein increased, Winston's dislike of the girl turned to hate. He hated her because she was young and pretty. A girl behind him, with thick, dark hair was screaming, Pig! Pig! At Goldstein suddenly he noticed someone else, sitting near the girl, wearing the black overalls of an inner party member. O'Brien was a large man with a thick neck and glasses. Although he looked frightening, Winston was interested in him. There was sometimes an intelligence in his face that suggested, perhaps, that he might question the official party beliefs. Winston had seen O'Brien about twelve times in almost as many years. Years ago he had dreamed about O'Brien. He was in a dark room and O'Brien had said to him, We shall meet in the place where there is no dark. Winston did not know what that meant, but he was sure it would happen, one day. The hate increased. The screaming increased. The voice and face of Goldstein became the voice and face of a real sheep. Then the sheep face became a Eurasian soldier. Walking towards them with his gun, so close that some people shut their eyes for a second and moved back in their seats. But at the same moment the soldier became the face of Big Brother. Black head, mustached, filling the telescreen. Nobody could hear what Big Brother said but it was enough that he was speaking to them. Then the face of Big Brother disappeared from the telescreen and the party slogans came up instead. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. Then everybody started shouting, BB. BB, again and again, slowly with a long pause between the first B and the second. Of course Winston shouted too, you had to. But there was a second when the look on his face showed what he was thinking. And at that exact moment his eyes met O'Brien's O'Brien was pushing his glasses up his nose. But Winston knew, yes he knew, that O'Brien was thinking the same thing as he was. I am with you, O'Brien seemed to say to him. I hate all this too. And then the moment of intelligence was gone and O'Brien's face looked like everybody else's. Winston wrote the date in his diary, 
April 4, 1984. Then he stopped. He did not know definitely that this was 1984. He was 39. He believed he had been born in 1944 or 1945. But nobody could be sure of dates, not really, who am I writing this diary for, he asked himself suddenly. For the future, for the unborn. But if the future was like the present, it would not listen to him. And if it was different, his situation would be meaningless. The telescreen was playing marching music. What had he intended to say? Winston stared at the page, then began to write, Freedom is the freedom to say that two and two make four. If you have that, everything else follows. He stopped. Should he go on? If he wrote more or did not write more, the result would be the same. The thought police would get him. Even before he wrote anything, his crime was clear. Thought crime, they called it. It was always at night, the rough hand on your shoulder, the lights in your face. People just disappeared, always during the night. And then your name disappeared. Your existence was denied and then forgotten. You were, in newspeak, vaporized. Suddenly he wanted to scream. He started writing, fast. Down with Big Brother. Down with Big Brother. Down with Big Brother. There was a knock on the door. Already. He sat as quietly as a mouse, hoping that they would go away. But no, there was another knock. He could not delay, that would be the worst thing he could do. His heart was racing but even now his face, from habit, probably showed nothing. He got up and walked heavily towards the door. Chapter 2 The Spies as he opened the door, Winston saw that he had left the diary open on the table. Down with Big Brother was written in it, in letters you could almost read across the room. But everything was all right. A small, sad-looking woman was standing outside. Oh, Comrade Smith, she said, in a dull little voice. Do you think you could come across and help me with our kitchen sink? The water isn't running away and it was Mrs. Parsons, his neighbor. She was about 30 but looked much older. Winston followed her into her flat. These repairs happened almost daily. The Victory Mansion's flats were old built in about 1930, and they were falling to pieces. Unless you did the repairs yourself, the party had to agree to them. It could take two years to get new glass in a window, Tom isn't home, Mrs. Parsons explained, the Parsons flat was bigger than Winston's and unattractive in a different way. Everything was broken. There were sports clothes and sports equipment all over the floor, and dirty dishes on the table. On the walls were the red flags of the Young People's League and the Spies and a full-sized poster of Big Brother. There was the usual smell of old food, but also the smell of old sweat. In another room someone was singing with the marching music that was still coming from the telescreen. It's the children, said Mrs. Parsons, looking in fear at the door to the other room. They haven't been out today and of course, she often stopped without finishing her sentences. 
In the kitchen, the sink was full of dirty green water. Of course if Tom was home, Mrs. Parsons started. Tom Parsons worked with Winston at the Ministry of Truth. He was a fat but active man who was unbelievably stupid and endlessly enthusiastic. He was a follower with no mind of his own, the type that the party needed even more than they needed the thought police. At 35 Tom Parsons had only just been thrown out of the Young People's League, although he had wanted to stay. Before that he had continued in the spies for a year beyond the official age. At the ministry he had a job which needed no intelligence, but he worked for the party every evening, organizing walks and other activities. The smell of his sweat filled every room he was in and stayed there after he had gone. Winston repaired the sink, taking out the unpleasant knot of hair that was stopping the water running away. He washed his hands and went back to the other room. Put your hands up, shouted a voice. A big, handsome boy of nine was pointing a toy gun at him. His small sister, about two years younger, pointed a piece of wood. Both were dressed in the blue, grey and red uniforms of the spies. Winston put his hands up. The look of hate on the boy's face made him feel that it was not quite a game. You're a Eurasian spy, screamed the boy. You're a thought criminal. I'll shoot you, I'll vaporize you. Suddenly they were both running round him, shouting, Spy! Thought criminal. The little girl did everything seconds after her older brother did it. It was frightening, like the games of young, dangerous wild animals that will soon be man-eaters. Winston could see that the boy really wanted to hit or kick him, and was nearly big enough to do so. He was glad that the gun in the boy's hand was only a toy. They wanted to see the Eurasian prisoners hang. But I'm too busy to take them and Tom's at, we want to see them hang, shouted the boy, and then the girl started shouting it too. Some Eurasian prisoners, guilty of war crimes against Oceania, were going to hang slowly in the park that evening. This happened every month or two and was a popular evening's entertainment. Children were often taken to see it, Winston said goodbye to Mrs. Parsons and walked towards the door. He heard a loud noise as a bomb fell. About twenty or thirty of them were falling on London each week. Then he felt a terrible pain in the back of his neck. He turned and saw Mrs. Parsons trying to take some sharp stones from her son's hand, Goldstein, screamed the boy. But Winston was most shocked by the look of helpless terror on Mrs. Parsons' grey face. Chapter 3 The Ministry of Truth Winston pulled the speak right towards him and put on his glasses. To the right of the speak right there was a small hole, to the left a larger one. In the office wall there was a third hole, larger than the other two. Messages came to Winston's office through the smallest hole. Newspapers came to him through the middle hole. The largest hole was for waste paper, hot air carried that away. These large holes were called memory holes, for some reason. Today for messages had come through the smallest hole, onto his desk. The messages were about changes to the Times newspaper. For example, 
In Big Brother's speech in the Times of the 17th of March, he had said that South India was safe. The Eurasians would attack North Africa. This had not happened. The Eurasians had attacked South India, not North Africa. Winston had to rewrite part of Big Brother's speech so you could read in. The times for the 17th of March that Big Brother had known about the attack before it happened when Winston had finished, his changes to the times went with the newspaper down the middle hole. A new edition would soon appear, with his changes. Every copy of the old edition would disappear. Destroyed. The message to Winston with the changes would disappear down the memory hole, to be burned. Everyday newspapers, magazines, Photographs, films, posters, and books were all changed. The past was changed. The party was always right. The party had always been right. The records department, where they destroyed all the old copies of everything, was the largest department in the Ministry of Truth, but there was no truth. The new copies were not true and the old copies had not been true either. For example, the Ministry of Plenty had said they would make 145 million pairs of boots last year. 62 million pairs were made. Winston changed 145 million to 57 million. So the party had made 5 million more boots last year than they expected to. But it was possible that no boots at all were made last year. And it was possible that nobody knew or cared how many boots were made. You could read in the newspapers that 5 million extra pairs of boots had been made and you could see that half the people in Oceania had no boots. Winston looked around the office. A woman with fair hair spent all day looking for the names of people who had been vaporized. Each of them was, in newspeak, an unperson. She took their names out of every newspaper, book, letter. Her own husband had been vaporized last year. She took his name out too. People disappeared from the newspapers when they were vaporized and they could also appear in the newspapers when they did not exist. Winston remembered Mr. Ogilvy. He had appeared in the newspapers because he had led the sort of life the party wanted. Ogilvy had joined the spies at the age of six. At eleven he told the Thought Police that his uncle was a criminal. At seventeen he had been an organizer in the Young People's League. At 19 he had invented a new bomb which had killed 31 Eurasians when it was first tried. At 23, Ogilvy had died like a hero, fighting the Eurasians. There were photographs of Ogilvy, but there had been no Ogilvy. Not really. The photographs were made at the Ministry of Truth. Ogilvy was part of a past that never happened. Anything could be changed. A dreamy man with hairy ears called Ampleforth rewrote old poems until they supported everything the party believed in. But all this work, all these changes, were not the main work of the Ministry of Truth. Most workers in the ministry were busy writing everything that the people of Oceania read or saw. All the newspapers, films, plays, poems, school books, telescreen programs and songs, the newspeak dictionaries and children's spelling books. 
After his morning's work, Winston went to the canteen. It was full, very noisy, and smelled of cheap food and a gin that was sold from a hole in the wall. Ah, I was looking for you, said a voice behind Winston. It was Syme, his friend from the dictionary department. Perhaps friend was not exactly the right word. You did not have friends these days, you had comrades. But some comrades were more interesting than others. Syme was working on the 11th edition of the Newspeak Dictionary. He was a small man, even smaller than Winston, with dark hair and large eyes. These eyes were sad, but they seemed to laugh at you and to search your face closely when he talked to you. Have you got any razor blades? asked Syme. None, said Winston quickly, perhaps too quickly. I've looked for them everywhere. Everyone was asking for razor blades. There had been none in the party shops for months. There was always something which the party could not make enough of. Sometimes it was buttons, sometimes it was wool, now it was razor blades. I've been using the same blade for six weeks, he lied. He actually had two new ones at home. The people waiting for food and gin moved forward, slowly. Winston and Syme took dirty plates from the pile. Did you go to the park yesterday? asked Syme. All the Eurasian prisoners were hanged, I was working, said Winston. I'll see it at the cinema. That's not as good, said Syme. His eyes looked hard at Winston's face. I know you. They seem to say. I know why you didn't go to see the prisoners die. Syme was an enthusiastic supporter of the party's decisions about war, prisoners, thought crime, the deaths in the underground rooms below the Ministry of Love. Winston always tried to move conversation with him away from all that. Syme knew a lot about Newspeak and when he talked about language he was interesting. The prisoners kicked when they were hanged, said Syme. I always like that. It spoils it when their legs are tied together. And one of them had his tongue hanging right out of his mouth. It was quite a bright blue. I like that kind of detail the next, please, called the Pole who was giving out the food, and Winston and Syme gave her their plates. She put some grey meat on each one. There was also some bread, a small piece of cheese and a cup of sugarless black coffee. There's a table there, under that telescreen, said Syme. Let's get a gin and sit there. The gin was poured for them into big cups and they walked through the crowded canteen to a metal table. There were some pieces of meat on the table from the last person's meal. They ate in silence. Winston drank down his gin, which brought tears to his eyes. How's the dictionary, he said, speaking loudly because of the noise. I'm on the adjectives, said Syme. It's wonderful work. His eyes shone. He pushed his plate away, took his bread in one pale hand and his cheese in the other, and put his mouth near Winston's ear so he did not have to shout. The eleventh edition is the final one, he said. We're building a new language. When we've finished, people like you will have to learn to speak again. You think the main job is inventing new words, don't you?
Wrong. We're destroying words, lots of them, hundreds of them, every day. We're only leaving the really necessary ones, and they'll stay in use for a long time. He ate his bread hungrily. His thin, dark face had come alive and his eyes were shining like the eyes of a man in love. It's a beautiful thing to destroy words, he said. For example, a word like good. If you have good in the language, you don't need bad. You can say ungood. Winston smiled. It was safer not to say anything. Syme continued. Do you understand? The aim of Newspeak is to narrow thought. In the end we will make thought crime impossible, because people won't have the words to think the crime. By the year 2050 there will be nobody alive who could even understand this conversation except Winston began and then stopped. He wanted to say, except the proles. But he was not sure if the party would accept the thought Syme had guessed what he was going to say. The proles are not really people, he said. By 2050 earlier, probably you won't need a slogan like freedom is slavery. The word freedom won't exist, so the whole idea of freedom won't exist either. The good party member won't have ideas. If you're a good party member, you won't need to think. One of these days, thought Winston, Sime will be vaporized. He is too intelligent. He sees too clearly and speaks too openly. He goes to the Chestnut Tree Cafe, where the painters and musicians go and where Goldstein himself used to go. The party does not like people like that. One day he will disappear. It is written in his face, Syme looked up. Here comes Parsons, he said. You could hear his opinion of Parsons in his voice. He thought Parsons was a fool. Winston's neighbor from Victory Mansions was coming towards them. He was a fat, middle-sized man with fair hair and an ugly face. He looked like a little boy in a man's clothes. Winston imagined him wearing not his blue party overalls, but the uniform of the spies. Parsons shouted, Hello, hello, happily, and sat down at the table. He smelled of sweat. Syme took a piece of paper from his pocket with a list of words on it and studied the words with an ink pencil between his fingers. Look at him, working in the lunch hour, said Parsons. What have you got there, old boy? Something a bit too clever for me, I expect. Smith, old boy, I'll tell you why I'm chasing you. It's the money you forgot to give me, what money, said Winston, feeling for money in his pocket. About a quarter of your earnings were paid back to the party in different ways. The money for hate week. You know I collect the money for victory mansions, and we're going to have the best flags around. Two dollars you promised me. Winston found two dirty dollar notes and gave them to Parsons. Parsons wrote two dollars very carefully in small clear letters next to Winston's name in a little notebook. It was clear that he rarely read or wrote, Oh, Smith, old boy, he said. I hear that son of mine threw stones at you yesterday. I talked to him about it. 
He won't do it again, believe me. I think he was angry because he couldn't see the Eurasian prisoners hang, said Winston, yes. Well, that shows what good children they are, doesn't it? Both of them. They only think about the spies, and the war, of course. Do you know what my girl did last week? She was on a walk in the country with the spies and she saw a strange man. She and two other girls followed him and then told the police about him. What did they do that for? Winston asked, shocked that they thought he was a Eurasian spy, said Parsons. They noticed his shoes were different, he added proudly. Winston looked at the dirty canteen, looked at all the ugly people in their ugly overalls, ate the terrible food and listened to the telescreen. A voice from the Ministry of Plenty was saying that they were all going to get more chocolate, 20 grams a week. Was he the only one who remembered that last week they got 30 grams? They were getting less chocolate, not more. But Parsons would not remember. And even a clever man like Syme found a way to believe it. Winston came out of his sad dream. The girl with dark hair, who he remembered from the two minutes hate, was at the next table. She was looking at him, but when he looked back at her she looked away again. Winston was suddenly afraid. Why was she watching him? Was she following him? Perhaps she was not in the thought police, but party members could be even more dangerous as spies. How had he looked when the telescreen voice told them about the chocolate? It was dangerous to look disbelieving. There was even a word for it in Newspeak, face crime, it was called. Winston ate the terrible food and listened to the telescreen. The girl had turned her back to him again. At that moment the telescreen told them all to return to work and the three men jumped to their feet. Chapter 4 Own Life Winston sat at the table and opened his diary. He thought of his parents. He was, he thought, about ten or eleven years old when his mother disappeared. She was a tall, silent woman with lovely fair hair. He could not remember his father so well. He was dark and thin and always wore dark clothes. They had both been vaporized in the 1950s. His thoughts moved to other women and he started writing in the diary. It was three years ago. It was on a dark evening, in a narrow side street near one of the big railway stations. She had a young face with thick makeup. I liked the makeup. The whiteness and the bright red lips. No woman in the party wore makeup. There was nobody else in the street and no telescreens. She said two dollars. I? It was too difficult to continue. Winston wanted to hit his head against the wall to kick the table over and throw the diary through the window anything to stop the memory of that night. It was, of course, illegal to pay a woman for sex. But the punishment was about five years in a work camp, not death. The party knew it happened. Some troll women sold themselves for a bottle of gin and the party didn't worry much about that. The party wanted to stop love and pleasure in sex, not sex itself. 
A request to marry would be refused if a man and a woman found each other attractive. Sex, to the party, was only necessary to make children. He thought of Catherine, his wife. Winston had been married. He was probably still married, if his wife was dead, nobody had told him. They had lived together for about fifteen months, nine, ten, eleven years ago. Catherine was a tall, fair-haired girl who moved well. She had an interesting face, until you found out that there was almost nothing behind it. She believed everything the party said. She had sex only because it was her duty to try and have children. When no children came, they agreed to separate. Every two or three years since then, Winston had found a prole woman who had agreed to have sex for money. But he wanted his own woman. He finished the story in his diary. When I saw her in the light she was quite an old woman. She had no teeth at all. But I had sex with her. He had written it down at last, but it did not help. He still wanted to shout and scream. He had walked several kilometers. It was the second time in three weeks that he had missed an evening at the party members club. This was not a good idea, your attendance at the club was carefully checked. A party member had no free time and was never alone except in bed. It was dangerous to do anything alone, even go for a walk. There was a word for it in Newspeak, own life, it was called, meaning separation from everybody else. He was walking in a pole area near a building that had, in the past, been an important railway station. The houses were small and dirty and reminded him of rat holes. There were hundreds of people in the streets, pretty young girls, young men chasing the girls, fat old women, the pretty girls in ten years' time. Dirty children with no shoes ran through the mud, the people looked at him strangely. The blue overalls of the party were an unusual sight in a street like this. It was unwise to be seen in such places, unless you had a definite reason to be there. The thought police would stop you if they saw you. Suddenly everybody was shouting and screaming and running back into their rat hole houses. A man in a black suit ran past Winston and pointed at the sky. Bon, he shouted. Up there. Bon. Winston threw himself to the ground. The proles were usually right when they warned you that a bomb was falling. When he stood up, he was covered with bits of glass from the nearest window. He continued walking. The bomb had destroyed a group of houses 200 meters up the street. And in front of him he saw a human hand, cut off at the wrist. He kicked it to the side of the road and turned right, away from the crowd. He was in a narrow street with a few dark little shops among the houses. He seemed to know the place. Of course. He was standing outside the shop where he had bought the diary. He was afraid, suddenly. He had been mad to buy the diary, and he had promised himself he would never come near this place again. But he noticed that the shop was still open, although it was nearly twenty-one hours. He would be safer inside than standing there doing nothing outside, so he went in. 
If anyone asked, he could say he was trying to buy a razor blade. The owner had just lit a hanging oil lamp which smelled unclean but friendly. He was a small, gentle-looking man of about sixty with a long nose and thick glasses. His hair was almost white, but the rest of his face looked surprisingly young. He looked like a writer, or perhaps a musician. His voice was soft and he didn't speak like a pole. I recognized you when you were outside, he said immediately. You're the gentleman who bought the diary. There's beautiful paper in that diary. No paper like that has been made for, oh, I'd say fifty years. He looked at Winston over the top of his glasses. Is there anything special I can do for you? Or did you just want to look round? I was, er, uh, passing, said Winston. And I just came in. I don't want to buy anything, well, that's all right, said the shop owner, because I haven't got much to sell you. He looked round the shop sadly. Don't tell anyone I said so, but it's difficult to get old things these days. And when you can get them nobody wants them. The old man's shop was full of things, but they were all cheap and dirty and useless. There's another room upstairs that you could look at, he said. Winston followed the man upstairs. The room was a bedroom with furniture in it. There was a bed under the window, taking nearly a quarter of the room. We lived here for thirty years until my wife died, said the old man sadly. I'm selling the furniture, slowly. That's a beautiful bed but perhaps it would be too big for you. Winston thought he could probably rent the room for a few dollars a week, if he dared to. It would be so peaceful to live as people used to live in the past, with no voice talking to you, nobody watching you. There's no telescreen, he said, ah, said the old man. I never had one. Too expensive, there was a picture on the wall. It showed a London church that used to be famous. In the days when churches were famous and people still went to them. Winston did not buy the picture, but he stayed in the room talking to the old man whose name, he discovered, was Charrington. Even when he left he was still thinking about renting the room. But then, as he stepped into the street, his heart turned to ice. A woman in blue overalls was walking towards him. Not ten meters away. It was the girl with dark hair, the one in the young people's league. The girl must be following him. Even if she was not in the Thought Police, she must be a spy. The Thought Police would come for him one night. They always came at night and they always caught you. And before they killed you, before you asked them on your knees to forgive you for your thought crime, there would be a lot of pain. 